Praise the Lord. We thank God for this day, saints. Welcome to today's Tea Time House broadcast. I'm so blessed. As you know, I'm privileged. I am highly favored to have another opportunity to come and speak life to you today. So I pray that your day is blessed, that you're encouraged, that if you're not blessed, it will be blessed, that if you're not encouraged, that you will be encouraged by our time of fellowship together with each other. Let's give God a praise, a hallelujah praise right now. Thank you, Jesus, for your blessings upon us. I'd like to speak with you today about a thought or a subject, our earnest expectation, our earnest expectation or our sincere expectation. And I, this thought or subject came to my mind as I was meditating upon the Lord today. The Holy Spirit was ministering to me about various situations, circumstances around my life, around the lives of some of the fellow members of our cell groups and some of my friends, distant and near, and team members on, on my uh, company. And really, it was speaking to me about the mindset of people, about what, what are we expecting from God? What are we expecting from ourselves? What are we expecting from others? And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today from some of the texts from Scripture and if you're going to be following along with me, I want to use as a foundational text, Romans chapter 8, verse number 19. Verse number 19. This is going to be a foundational text that I want to use to develop the thought or the subject. Someone said to me, earnest expectation. Romans 8. 19 reads for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Let us pray. Father, I thank you. I praise you on this day. I rejoice in you for you along with God. You are healer. You are provider. You are deliverer and you have healed. You are provided for and you have delivered us. I decree and declare that over each and every person under the sound of hearing my voice. I believe you heal them physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially, relationally, socially, in every way. I believe that you provided for them for whatever their need. For you are a God who supplies all of our needs. That you've delivered them from sickness and sin and doubt and worry and confusion and any spirit of oppression or depression. I thank you for their deliverance today. Father, and we expect... We earnestly expect for your sustainability power to maintain us and keep us from falling back into areas that you have delivered, saved, and provided for us. We've received it as so today, so as the Holy Spirit ministers through your word, let us see the manifestation or the revealing of your plan and your purpose in the lives of the hearers today. Bring alive the part of us that you have been waiting for to be awakened in us, to be seen in us, to be shown through us on this day in Jesus name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And let's say, amen. Praise the Lord, saints. Earnest expectation. I want to speak about that thought or subject a little bit today, saints. And, and those of you who follow my broadcast, you know, I'm always into bringing understanding, trying to help bring understanding to the body of Christ. Because the more we understand, the more we'll be able to walk in the plan of God. And walk according to the plan, the perfect plan of God. And so it's very important that we, with all of our getting, that we get understanding. And so I want you to have a better understanding of what it means to, have ex to expect and more deeply to have an earnest expectation or a sincere expectation or a reasonable expectation. But one of the things about expectation is in order to have what we call this earnest expectation, it means that we must place no limits on God. We must place no limits on God. If you listen to our song of preparation, I posted it to our Facebook page about expectations, miracles, signs, and wonders. And so if we have a limited expectation of God or from God, we're going to be limited in our ability to receive certain things from God. 
So I really want you to get in your mind today that expectation, when we talk about it as an earnest expectation, it means that you must place no limitation on God. Don't, don't place any limitation on what God can do. Don't put a limitation on what God has done. Don't place a limitation on what God will do, can do, wants to do through you. And sometimes that can be difficult because our mind is conditioned to what we have experienced in life up to this point. I find that a lot of what people do as adults, they experience as children or as youth. And they still pretty much living out whatever expectation was level was set from that season of conditioning. So prayerfully, as we go through today's message, we'll get a new conditioning of our mind. You know, when we think about what Paul says, I believe in the book of Romans, that we must be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That means that you have to change your expectations or have new expectations. Different new expectations of yourself, new expectations from God, new expectations of what you think others can and will and should do in your life. And so all of these things put together should be able to push us to the place where we see, began to see, or where God begins to see the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. Now, the fact that he says, I want the manifestation of the sons of God, suggests to us that you are already a son or daughter of God. It's just that you have not been fully manifested. You have not revealed itself. So this message is designed to help to, to remove the covering or to chisel off the things around your life that are causing you to live below place or living below the level of expectation that God has designed for you. And so here the Apostle Paul in this particular text is writing to the believers in Rome to remove some of the excess layers of things in life that may convince them that they should feel comfortable staying right where they are. Not expecting anything better, anything more, anything different in their lives. There's a, there's a season of what I call sustainability. And it means that you've been through seasons of stops and starts. God showed little glimpses or little flashes of what you could potentially be. Well, you may have experienced it for certain spans of time, but then it goes away for a span of time. Then it comes back for a span of time. Some people may call it a spirit of cycle. Or, or, but so a cycle is something, um, if you think about a bicycle, a bicycle, okay? Bi means two. You're pedaling it with both legs. It has two tires. Tricycle means it has three, okay? And so what has to happen is that in order for a bicycle or a tricycle to work, certain things must happen repetitively. Those are cycles. They happen repetitively in your life. It's a constant effort, motion to keep the bicycle moving forward or the tricycle or whatever, whatever type of uh, mode of moving that is. Same thing with an engine, the pistons in the engine. They, they rotate on cycles. They go around continually. Now, we don't want you to have to stay on certain cycles because that means if you stay on a certain cycle, not only will you uh, have those cycles of going forward, but you have those cycles of stopping and having to start over again. The spirit of sustainability, which is going to help bring about this manifestation, is designed to keep you in perpetual motion moving forward with God. Even when it seems like you're standing still, you're moving forward with God. At most major airports, they have this little thing called an excavator. It's like, it looks like a stairway, but the stairs are moving. So even when you step on the escalator, you are not physically moving in motion, but the escalator is taking you forward, upward, or downward. This is a, the power of sustainability that I want to see manifested in each and every one of God's children. 
in the lives of each and every one of God's children, which I want to believe that you who are listening to my voice now, you have already accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You believe that he died on the cross for your sins and that he rose again that you may rise to new life. And not only life, but have a life more abundantly than you had it before. Leaving all the excess bandage baggage aside. So again, that, that, that depiction, if you can picture in your mind this thing called the escalator. And they even have something else that's like a little sidewalk. It's not stairs, but it's like a little belt that's rotating. You just stand on the belt and it takes you down the aisle without you having to walk. This is the power that God is looking for. This is, the, this, this is what God wants us to begin to expect in our lives, that it would take less of our effort and we put our effort aside and allow God just to push us forward in life, push us toward our destiny, take us without our own doing because we grow weary, but God has no weariness in himself. He has a perpetual power that he wants us to begin to, to, to operate in our lives. And so I want to back up to the first verse of chapter 8 because it's difficult to take a verse out of a chapter that contains, in this particular instance, contains 39 verses and think that we're going to understand the context of what the writer was saying to us. I want someone to say to me, earnest expectation. That is, you're looking for the perpetual power of God to sustain you that will manifest in you, through you, around you, the perfect plan that God has always desired to see manifested through you, sooner than God. So let's look at verse 1. The see the Apostle Paul began before he got to this place about God is awaiting the manifestation of the sons of God or the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. He says, in order to get to this place, verse 1, first we got to understand that there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now the enemy would trick us, convince us that, you know, we're not worthy. We, we, we're not deserving. We're still just as worse off as we ever been. We, we may have put on different clothes, but we're still the same person in the clothes. There's a little saying that some people say you can take the boy or girl out of the city, but you can't take the city out of the boy or girl or the country or whatever this case may be. In other words, it's saying that you can change the environment that you put a person in, but they still going to be that same person in a different environment. And this is what the devil wants to make us believe, the enemy of our souls. For this is a battle for souls. And this is why the scripture says he's a, God is a, a, eagerly, has an eager expectation for the manifestation of the sons of God and the daughters of God. It said creation, verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits the revealing or the manifestation of the sons of God. God is waiting for you to step on the escalator to allow him just to move you forward. To move you forward without the stop and start. Relying on God's power, not your own power. Trusting in God's provision, not your employer's provision. Trusting in God's favor, not your boss's favor. Step on, step on the escalator today and allow God to just transport you from one place to another without your own effort or under your own power. This is what creation is eagerly, eagerly awaits it, saints of God. Yeah. So Paul began by saying, before we get to that place, understand this. Don't believe what the devil is saying about you. Don't believe what others are saying about you, whether they're saying good things and or bad things. The only thing that matters is God's word. Whatever God has spoken concerning you. This is what God is waiting to be manifested. For he is watching over his word. He wants to perform it in you. But if you allow what the enemy is saying, if you allow what others are saying, 
to take precedence over what God is trying to say to you, you'll never be fully manifested as the sons and daughters of God, as God has fully intended for each of us. He says, verse 1, Therefore there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Part of the flesh is what, the, what your mind tells you. Part of your flesh is what your body tells you. Part of your flesh is what your heart tells you when it causes fear and doubt and worry. Saints, we are, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You are in Christ if you've accepted Christ. You believed on Christ. You received the gift of his Holy Spirit. There is now no condemnation, no matter what the enemy tries to get you into, no matter what you may even allow the enemy to put you into. God is not going to condemn you. God loves you unconditionally. He simply desires that you manifest your true identity as the sons and daughters of God and do not allow the things that you've been entangled with, things that the enemy wants to entangle you with, to sidetrack you to get you all focused, to make you think less than yourself, to make you expect that, hey, God, I mean, this is the best I can get now considering what I've done. Paul says, and the Holy Spirit says, today there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For the law, verse 2, of the Spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. Verse 3, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. This is the escalator I'm talking about. You could not free yourself from your sin. So God put you on the escalator and said, just ride the escalator to the top. Jesus served as the escalator to transport us from sin to victory. Again, he says in verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in who? In us. He did it for who? In us. He did it in order that the righteous requirement of God would be revealed in us. This is why creation is eagerly waiting for us to be revealed as we have now been made to be cleansed and free from sin. And this is the reason why what we just read right here. It says that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who, did, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is an enemy against God. It is not subject to the law of God, nor Indeed, can it be? It's going to do what it wants to do. It's going to stay. It wants to keep doing what it's always done. If the enemy have trapped you with one thing, he wants to continue to try to entrap you with that same old thing over and over and over again. In order to cause you not to expect anything else to change. Really, you begin to expect that this is only going to last for a moment and then I'm going to go right back to the same things again. So I better get as much good as I can get out of it now because it's going to turn bad in a moment. That's a cycle again. If we've been experiencing that, then, then we're going to start to be expecting that. I want to get an earnest expectation where we're expecting God to sustain us on our road to victory, on our path to victory, in our path of deliverance, in our healing, in our provision, in our overflow. We're not going to go back to being broke again after we have been made wealthy. We're not going to go back to being sick again after we've been made healed. We're not going to get entangled again back to that, those addictions or that man or that woman or pride or jealousy or whatever it was that binds us. We're not going to go, go back through those cycles because God's going to break it. He, matter of fact, he's already broken it. It's just a matter of it being manifested in our lives. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying to the church in Rome, what the Holy Spirit is saying to us today. 
Verse 7 again, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor can it be. You can't get free on your own effort. You can't change yourself. God has to change you. You can't transform yourself. You may try to reform yourself, but you can't transform yourself. Verse 8, so then those who are in the flesh, they cannot please God. As long as you operate under that old way of thinking and old way of doing, you cannot please God, even though you're trying. This is why you must get under the, the perpetual, sustainable power of God, like the escalator I described to you. You may have just enough strength to get to the bottom of the escalator, but once you get there, he'll take you to the top under his own power. You don't have to put no effort to get to the top, to the next level. Jesus serves as the escalator to try and take us from the place of defeat to victory, saints of God. Verse 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. This is why we must receive that precious gift of the Holy Spirit. So we believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts chapter 2 says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Yeah, have you received it? If you haven't, no, son, I believe in you, Lord. I want to receive the gift that you gave me. The gift that empowers me to, make, to have a sustainable power above my sin. To have a sustainable power against my weakness, my sickness, my lack. I want a power to rise above those circumstances and situations in my life. I don't want to go back. And with your help, I, I don't have to go back. So as the Spirit of God dwells in you, it says... You are free from that. Verse 10. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. You see, there's a new way as opposed to an old way. If you abide in the old way, which is in this instance is speaking about the flesh, then you're going to stay under the same condition. But, somebody say but. But you see the scripture says here. But the spirit is life because of righteousness, not your righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The escalator, the perpetual sustainable power of God that transforms you from who you are to who God intends for you to be. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Hallelujah. You see how the perpetual power of God, Paul is trying to get people to understand that this is nothing that you have to do. This is something that's already been done for you. All you have to do is step on the escalator. Allow it to take you to the next level. This is what God wants us to do today, saints of God. Stop trying to figure this thing out. It may, have, it may never make sense to you what God does. I've, I, I've come to realize that what God does doesn't make any sense to me. And I'm okay with that. You must learn to be okay with that. You must learn to say, oh, it doesn't matter if I understand it or not. What matters is that your will is done through my life. Somebody said, earnest expectation. Again, he says, verse 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you, verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But, see that but again, but if you take the escalator right there to your right, hallelujah, but if the spirit, but if by the spirit you put the death, the deeds of the body, you will live and prosper and grow and become who God intends for you to be. Verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God and daughters of God. What qualifies you to be a son and a daughter of God? Let's read it again. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Those who have decided to take the escalator instead of the stairs. Hallelujah, saints of God. Hallelujah. Verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again. You did not receive a spirit from Christ that would lead you back into your bondage. See what it says. For you did not again. 
receive the spirit of bondage to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Father, I belong to you. I don't belong to my addiction anymore. I don't belong to my flesh anymore. I don't belong to my doubts anymore. I don't belong to my, my oppression, my depression anymore. I cry, Abba, Father, I belong to you. Somebody say, hallelujah, earnest expectation. Hallelujah, saints. Verse 16, the spirit himself bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We just have to act like it. We just need to look like it. We just need to be made right, look right, do right, live up to the namesake for which Christ has called you. If we call ourselves Christian, we must become Christ-like. It says in verse number 16 again, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then we are heirs. You have to recognize that you, you have inherited everything the Father has dominion over. Then if we are children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Everything Christ is entitled to, we as God's children are entitled to in the earth. Earnest expectation. He says, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Saints, I don't care what you've gone through or what you're going through, good times, bad times, or whatever it is. It has no comparison to what God wants to do in your life. No matter how good you have it right now, you, you, you have no idea. It doesn't even compare to the glory that God wants to do in your life. If you're suffering and going through hardships and, and crisis, God wants to turn that thing around for you even now. But he's waiting. Whole creation is waiting. It's waiting, saints of God. This is who you are intended to be, victorious. You're intended to be the head, not the tail, above and not beneath. The lenders are not the borrowers. You're intended to be blessed in the city and the field, blessed when you come in and come out. But you have to expect that from God. And the way you get this is by allowing God's spirit to dwell in you. As I, as I said throughout this message, you must take the escalator, not the stairs. Then we get down to our foundational text. It says, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits the manifestation of the sons of God or the children of God. You see that he's already described to us that if we have Christ's spirit in us, we are God's children. If you have received Jesus Christ into your life today, saints, you are his children. You are his child. He has a plan. He has a purpose for your life. He doesn't want you to live on the street when he's built a house for you. He don't want you to live sick when he's, he's died to heal you. He don't want you to live broke and poor when he's made provision for you. He don't want you to stay in bondage when he sets you free. Today, will you surrender your own way and your own will and your own wants to God's will, God's way and his wants for your life? This is what it means to take the escalator instead of the stairs. This is what it means to have an earnest expectation that I shall be received as the son of God, that I have received the spirit of adoption. I have not received the spirit of fear to go back into bondage. Father, I thank you today. I thank you that the words that's been spoken, the words that have been written, the words that are going into the hearing of the listeners today will penetrate beyond their mind, penetrate beyond the surface of their heart, that it would go to the root of every thought that they have right now, that it will convince, that it will convert them even now, that they will begin to see signs, wonders, and miracles, that the manifestation will begin to take place in their lives, that they will begin to rise above every situation, every circumstance that tries to hinder them. I decree and declare even now, according to your word, that for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. So even right now, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ, today can be the day that you become a child of God and that you begin to manifest the glory of God's wonder, the splendor of God's majesty in and around and through your life. May it be so even now, Holy Spirit. Touch us, teach us, 
lead us, guide us, mold us, and shape us as we have an earnest expectation to be revealed and manifested as the sons and daughters of God. Amen. <laughs>